It's a pleasure to be welcoming you to our second State of Democracy lecture for the year. I'm Grant Reher, director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, the organization which coordinates the series. On behalf of Syracuse University, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Well, our uh, topic today, of course, needs no introduction, but before I offer some brief comments on what we are aiming to add to the existing conversations that are already going on about impeachment, I wanna issue some heartfelt thanks. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for coming. You've, you've probably been watching this all day today, so thank you for also coming to, to hear us talk about it. Uh, and uh, I, I, I want to also thank in particular the, the student groups who, who are here and, and brought some of their members. Uh, I wanna thank the Dean's Office for supporting the series and for technical support, the Information and Computing Technology Group and in particular, Tom Fazio. Thanks as well to Kelly Coleman and Sanju Rabeck who work in the Campbell Institute and help put together these events. And I wanna thank, in addition, my Campbell colleagues, um, several of them, who suggested to me that, that we do something on this and, and for also encouraging uh, their students to attend. So let me just uh, issue a few reminders for all of us. First, if you haven't already silenced your cell phones, please do that. Uh, a few words about our format. We're engaging in a, and Peggy's gotta go do that. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. So regarding our format, we're engaging in a panel discussion. And first, we'll hear some remarks from each of the four panelists in turn uh, that reflect their own sets of expertise and experiences that they bring to bear on the subject. And Maxwell is particularly fortunate to have scholars with such rich backgrounds to draw on in order to help us better understand what's been happening and what's likely to happen. After each panelist has had a chance to speak, we'll move to a brief and lightly moderated discussion among the group of four, but then we'll also leave a good chunk of time at the end for your questions and brief comments. And when we get to that portion, the audience Q&A, please do wait for one of the microphones to be passed to you so that you are able to be heard by your colleagues here in the room, but also so that you are part of the archive of the event and the live stream. And then following the talk, we'll have a reception back out here in the foyer where there will be refreshments and where we can continue the conversation that we begin here. Now let me just end with a, a few words about our rationale and our panelists. The idea was to provide some context and some framing for the avalanche of media coverage that you've been hit with and to give you some information and perspective that might be useful to you in sifting through and reasoning over what you're yet to hear. And as I said earlier, Maxwell is especially well stocked um, for such an effort. My Campbell colleagues who will engage in this enterprise are in the order in which they will first speak, Professor Tom Keck, who holds the Michael O. Sawyer Chair of Constitutional Law and Politics at the Maxwell School. His research focuses on constitutional courts and the use of legal strategies by movements on the left and the right. Then we'll hear from Professor Peggy Thompson from History and Political Science, who teaches on the presidency and who has written on Congress. Professor Shana Guderian will follow Professor Thompson. She's from political science. She teaches and writes about political psychology, public opinion and political communication, and also gender and politics. And then finally, university professor Sean O'Keefe from public administration and international affairs, who holds the Fan Steel Chair in strategic management and leadership, and who has served in several capacities in past, in past presidential administrations, not this one, he wants me to add. <laughs> but his positions have included, and this is a partial list, bear in mind, Secretary of the Navy, Head of NASA, Deputy Director of OMB, and Deputy Assistant to the President. So as you can see, it's an all-star cast, and I'm really looking forward to learning from this group. So Professor Keck, start us up. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna stand up because otherwise I can't see my own 
slides. Um, so, uh, so my task today is to talk uh, briefly um, about the framers' view of impeachment, and then a little bit about the first case of presidential impeachment in our history, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. And then my colleague, Professor Thompson, is going to pick up the story from there. And I only have 10 minutes, so I might talk fast, right? Um, so let's start with the framers. Um, uh, Here's what the Constitution says about the impeachment of the president, right? The president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment of and conviction, conviction for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, as with uh, most provisions in the constitutional text, it is brief. Um, it doesn't come with a glossary, right? It doesn't tell us what any of those words mean, right? And so we have to consult other sources to try to figure out what exactly the framers were thinking about um, when they wrote these words. Uh, the key text is the Federalist Paper number 65 uh, by Alexander Hamilton. Um, and so I wanna focus uh, most of my comments on that document. I, I only got 10 minutes, so I'm gonna talk, about, talk to you about one document, right? Um, but it's the leading um, uh, founding era writing on impeachment, right? It's Hamilton's case for why we put the impeachment power in the Constitution and why we designed it the way that we did. Um, so what the first thing you'll see um, is that Hamilton says that the impeachment process is to designed to address those offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men, right? Or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. Um, one thing that you hear um, uh, uh, some talk about uh, in the media is um, whether impeachment uh, requires violation of a federal criminal statute. And the answer, it, from Hamilton's perspective, is no, right? Uh, criminal prosecution and impeachment are two separate processes. The impeachment process is designed to deal with abuses of power, violations of some public trust. Apologies in advance for throwing several long quotes at you, but that's what constitutional scholars do, right? So here's another one. Um, they are of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be denominated political. So he's continuing from the previous quote, right? The kinds of abuses of power that he's talking about. They are of a nature which may with peculiar propriety be denominated political as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. This power is designed to put a stop to abuses of power that harm American society, right? Not the same as prosecuting somebody for a criminal violation. Um, then this next part is interesting. The prosecution of them for this reason will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community and to divide it into parties more or less friendly or inimical to the accused. This was written more than 200 years ago, people. Right? It's not about Donald Trump. Um, so, um, so he says that. Um, and, and then he continues here um, with that same line of thinking. In many cases, this process will connect itself with the pre-existing factions and will enlist all their animosities, partialities, influence, and interest on one side or on the other. And in such cases, there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of parties than by the real demonstration of innocence or guilt. I've heard, um, uh, I've heard one or two um, Republican uh, members of Congress or other figures talking about the impeachment process, but I think I've heard it from a couple members, sitting members of Congress who've referenced this passage from Hamilton in an effort to say the current impeachment inquiry is a partisan witch hunt, right? It's not really about any real determination of innocence or guilt. It's about the comparative strength of parties and inst institutions. So that is like, a, that is half of what Hamilton is saying, right? Hamilton is warning us about the danger both that a partisan faction could wrongly try to impeach an innocent president, and that a partisan faction could wrongly try to acquit a guilty president, right? If you read the essay in full, he's clearly concerned with both possibilities. And the context for this passage in the essay is he's talking about why did we assign this power to the Senate, to the House to bring the charges of impeachment, and then to the Senate to conduct the trial. Um, and he says, um, we considered a variety of alternatives. It seemed to us uh, that it's such a momentous decision to undertake um, that it seemed to us best to lodge the power with the people's elected representatives in Congress. He says explicitly that some folks had suggested holding the trial in the Supreme Court. 
instead of the Senate. We, can't, we shouldn't do that for several reasons, Hamilton says. The Supreme Court is too small, too unrepresentative, and might have to weigh in on the case again after the president is impeached and removed from office and he gets criminally prosecuted for the same acts, right? Because the constitutional text clearly contemplates both. If you are impeached and removed from office and if you also violated a federal criminal law, you can then be indicted. And this is a long quote, which you don't have to read, but he says, after having been sentenced and removed from office, then if you get prosecuted, that case might wind up in the Supreme Court and we don't want them ruling on it twice, right? So he is, cons we lodged it in the Senate the trial power, because it is the best available option, but we recognize that that creates a danger that partisanship is gonna influence the proceedings, but it is still the best available option, and we are hopeful that the good statesmen in our Senate will um, exercise their powers uh, based on a real effort to determine the innocence or guilt of the persons involved. Okay, so in the early republic, um, there were several impeachments of federal judges, Right? But the first attempted impeachment of a US president um, is Andrew Johnson. Um, and I'm drawing here on, on a great recent book about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. I highly recommend it by Brenda Wineapple. And let me just make a few quick points about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson that, that may have some relevance for today. So Andrew Johnson, of course, um, was not elected president, right? He takes the office after Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. Andrew Johnson was um, not, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, but when he ran for reelection, he had selected a Democrat, a pro-union, but nonetheless Democrat um, as his running mate in order to shore up his reelection chances. So Andrew Johnson had very different views than President Lincoln and he succeeds to the office on Lincoln's uh, assassination. Um, and President Johnson abuses the powers of the office from day one, right? At least according to his Republican opponents in Congress, right? They see it as a long systematic pattern of impeachable conduct from day one when Johnson takes the office, there are calls for his impeachment. And throughout 1867, there are impeachment inquiries underway in the House Judiciary Committee. They, they don't go anywhere, right? They, they, but there's uh, uh, um, and, like the initial steps of impeachment inquiries throughout 1867. Um, so long pattern of an impeachable conduct. And during Q&A, we can talk more about all of the impeachable things he did, but, re but repeated abuses of the powers of his office. Right? And then eventually the dam breaks, right? Eventually he does one more thing, right? He abuses his powers one time too many, and then the House impeaches him in three days, right? President Johnson illegal, illegally fires the Secretary of War without Senate approval, as was required by the Tenure of Office Act, a law that Congress had passed expressly to prohibit the President from trying to interfere with Reconstruction, right? Congress and the Union Army are trying to um, uh, 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 reintegrate the southern states into the Union and protect the rights of the recently freed slaves while doing so. The Union Army is still state, the war's over, but the Union Army is still stationed in the South trying to register black voters. Um, uh, President Johnson is opposed to that effort, and so he fires the Secretary of War, which was illegal, right? In three days, they impeach him. Um, in three days, very quick proceeding. Um, uh, and uh, he then gets acquitted in the Senate by a single vote, right? Constitution requires a simple majority vote in the House, but it requires a two-thirds vote in the Senate, which is a high bar. Senate comes one vote short. Um, if you read Brenda Wineapple's account, um, uh, there was widespread expectations at the beginning that he was gonna be convicted and removed from office. Republicans appeared to have enough votes for that. If you read Brenda Wineapple's account, there's three main reasons why the Senate comes up just short and he stays in office. Um, one was bribery. A couple senators appear to have been paid off um, by the Johnson administration. Um, two was that there was some sentiment that maybe we impeached him for the wrong thing. He like abused his powers like all year long. And then this one most recent thing he did was not the worst thing he did, but that's what the articles of impeachment were focused on. So, so some of the senators were raising that as a kind of legal legalistic argument uh, against convicting him. And three, there were very significant disputes in the Senate about the political, the electoral implications, the immediate electoral implications of removing the president from office. Um, when they impeached him three days after he fired the Secretary of War, that was during an election year. It was February 1868, right? So 
if you hear somebody saying we shouldn't impeach the president because we got an election coming up soon, right? That didn't stop them. They impeached him in election year because um, the violations of, of, of the office, of the abuse of power was so clear. Um, the vice presidency was vacant at the time. He had been vice president, had acceded to the presidency. There was no vice president. Under the presidential rules of succession, the next in line for the presidency was the president pro tem of the Senate, Benjamin Wade, who was a Republican that many of his fellow Republican senators hated, and they did not want him to become president. And he would have become president if um, Johnson was convicted and removed from office. They wanted the next president to be Ulysses Grant, right? The war hero, the Union general who had defeated Robert E. Lee, who had won the war. Um, he, has, he was widely popular. He was planning to run for president. They didn't want Benjamin Wade to be the incumbent president, right? Because then Grant couldn't run. They're in the same party, right? So for direct political calculations, they decide to leave Johnson in office as a battered, bruised, and weakened president for the remainder of his term. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Thompson. Thank you. I have, I have to listen to me. Um, let me read you a brief passage from a congressional committee considering some potentially impeachable offenses by an American president. And this is a quote from their final report. The Constitution requires the president to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. This charge encompasses a responsibility to leave the members of his administration in no doubt that the rule of law governs. For failing to take care that the law reigns supreme, the president bears full responsibility. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? He failed to see that the law reigns supreme, and he bears full responsibility. This was the report of the bicameral bipartisan committee on Iran-Contra about President Ronald Reagan. And the question that we can ask is, why did they decide not to pursue articles of impeachment? And that leads to one of the main points that I want to make that kind of builds upon some of what Professor Keck said, and that is that impeachment is not necessarily a legal phenomenon as much as it is also a political one. And Ronald Reagan was frankly a very popular president. It was at the end of his second term. And um, there was a clear sense that in neither house would the votes be available to either impeach him or remove him from office. And I think they were right in that regard. But that raises another question, because in the two other 20th century cases that we have, the case of Richard Nixon, who was not impeached, but who clearly would have been not only impeached, but removed from office had he not resigned, and in the case of Bill Clinton, who was impeached, but who was not removed from office, we're dealing with individuals who are both um, in their second terms, and in the case of Bill Clinton, very popular. At the height of the impeachment controversy over Bill Clinton, his popularity, his public approval rating was 73%, and it never fell below the low 60s. So he was very popular. Richard Nixon was very different, but both of these individuals, both of these individuals had been reelected fairly overwhelmingly prior to the consideration of impeachment against them. Richard Nixon had carried 49 of 50 states, and Bill Clinton had not even carried a majority, but he had overwhelmingly defeated his Republican opponent, Bob Dole, in the Electoral College. So what happened? Why were these two cases carried out the way they were, and uh, why, in neither case, did they succeed? Well, the case of Richard Nixon didn't succeed because he left office. 
he resigned before he could have a formal vote. But he, there were articles of impeachment voted on by the House Judiciary Committee. And in that regard, it was very different from the case that we're dealing with right now. All of the votes in the House of Representatives, I mean, in the, in the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives were bipartisan. On um, the two principal, three articles of impeachment were recommended to the House, and on two of them, six of the 17 Republican members voted in favor of recommending those articles of impeachment. Those were on obstruction of justice and abuse of power. On contempt of Congress, only two Republicans voted to support it. One Republican member, Lawrence Hogan, who is the, uh, the father of the current um, Republican governor of Maryland, voted in favor of all three. So it was a more bipartisan vote. In the case of the Clinton impeachment, there were two articles that were recommended to the House and actually passed by the House. One was that he lied to the grand jury. I did not have sex with that woman. The other was obstruction of justice. In both cases, five Democrats voted in favor of impeachment. On the first article, five Republicans voted no, and eight Republicans voted no on the second obstruction of justice article. I think the main other point I want to make to you, and of course he was, he was exonerated in the Senate, no Democrats voted in favor of conviction, and 10, uh, let's see, in, in the Senate, um, 10 Republicans voted not guilty on lying, and five on obstruction of justice. So he was, he was not convicted. I think the important thing to realize, and I've heard this not only in a lot of the literature I've read, but also in some of the commentary that's going on on television right now, and a point I want to leave you with is that impeachment is not an event as much as it is a process. People do not just get impeached because they do one thing wrong. In the case of Richard Nixon, he had been abusing power for years. In the case of Bill Clinton, it was felt that he had been behaving inappropriately for a long time. And so the impeachment, as Professor Keck suggested with the violation of the Tenure of Office Act, was one act too many, but it was not an isolated act. And the other point that I want to leave you with is, has to do with conviction in the Senate. And Professor Keck talked a little bit about that, but I think there's one important point that I haven't seen a lot of discussion about, but I think we need to think about it and consider it as we are dealing right now with an impeachment um, case that may well end up in the United States Senate. And that is that although it's one thing to say, let's look at what the founders said and what the founders intended, but we need to realize that the Senate of 2019 is not the Senate of the founders. And I don't mean that in some kind of philosophical sense. I mean it in the sense that the Senate is now popularly elected, and it wasn't in the days of the founders. The Senate was supposed to be a more deliberative and um, more responsible body not popularly elected. And this is a point that hasn't gotten a lot of attention uh, from, the, from the commentators and even from a lot of the constitutional scholars. So I leave you with that. You may decide that's insignificant, but I do think it's worth thinking about what the implications of that might be. And on that, I turn it over to Professor Guderian. All right. Ooh, Sorry. Um. <laughs> So um, I am going to briefly talk about um, current public opinion on impeachment and what we might see going forward. Now, I'm going to start with the caveat that political scientists are not very good at telling you the future, mm -hmm. but I can tell you a little bit something about the past and about the role 
of public opinion in this process um, and more generally in American politics. So public opinion here is going to provide a constraint on elites and what elites can do. And the House can take the kind of public opinion of, their, of the people they're representing as a signal as to how they should vote. And this is true of the Senate as well. And so I do think this, this point about popular election is really important and it's gonna tell you something, I'm not gonna predict what's gonna happen in 2020, but I think where you might see leverage in the Senate on votes that could flip across, that we might not expect Democrats who would vote not to remove, and Republicans who would vote to remove, are those places in the country where public opinion is strongly um, on one side or another, and those um, senators are up for re-election in 2020. So I think that's where you would see some chance of um, votes you might not expect otherwise. We also should note that public opinion is very much shaped by elites. Unlike you, who have decided to spend your afternoon on a Friday thinking and talking about impeachment, most people pay little attention to politics most of the time. And that, it makes sense for most people because it's not interesting it's co or it's complicated um, and it doesn't affect people's day-to-day -day lives that much. So how do people decide what they think about issues like impeachment? They're looking for cues from elites from their party. And they trust those things and they, uh, those views and they sometimes just adopt them, okay? I think polarization matters a great deal. So one of the things we haven't talked about is how far the parties have gotten away from each other on both policy issues and on what we might call partisan affect. We have a phenomenon called negative partisanship this day, these days, which is not just I identify with my party, but I also dislike people of the other party, and I dislike the other party a great deal. That has grown exponentially in the last couple of decades, and it shapes how people think about impeachment. And the mass media matters in, how, in getting us, giving us a sense of what impeachment is about, what are the frames around impeachment, and how should we interpret what is going on right now in the hearings. Okay, so I'm gonna just briefly, so some of these um, lessons have already been touched on, but I think it's worth noting, we have some lessons from Bill Clinton, right? Um, Clinton approval at the beginning of the impeachment inquiry um, was about 60%. And I'm gonna show you what Donald Trump's approval looked like. It is not 60%, okay? Um, throughout the impeachment proceedings of the Bill Clinton era, his, as um, Professor Thompson noted, his approval ratings increased, okay? But the 1990s um, are a very different time, right? Again, this idea of negative partisanship is a lot lower, people um, are, um, maybe less hostile toward the other side. We're dealing with a much more popular president. We have a much less fragmented media system. We are now living in a media system that um, not only has ideological media outlets on cable, but also where people are just, um, have many more options across the board and many more options to not pay attention to politics at all. Um, the, uh, the, there were about 43 million people who watched um, Bill Clinton's State of the Union, that, which was in the middle of the impeachment inquiry. You don't get numbers like that anymore, okay? Um, I think also we want to talk about the, the, the kinds of issues that were being talked about in the Clinton inquiry were, per, it, while they are connected to obstruction of justice, or people consider them to be more personal in nature rather than about foreign policy and the workings of government. Okay, so how might these things map onto today? So one I wanna show you, this is from 538. This is what Donald Trump approval ratings look like from the beginning of his presidency to now. So he is about, if you look, and this is aggregating over lots of polls, and this is looking at all voters, his approval rating is about 40%. And, um, with his disapproval rating about 55%, and those remaining people don't pay attention uh, enough attention to know what they think about Donald Trump, which is surprising, because <laughs> everyone else knows what they think about him. Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us we're already starting an impeachment inquiry with someone who's a uh, president who's already um, overall quite unpopular, except among Republican voters who are still very supportive of Donald Trump. And I think that is worth, and that maps onto their ideas about whether impeachment is okay and whether or not um, it should proceed. 
Um, if you're interested in where, um, where uh, other presidents were at this time in their presidency, um, we're, we're looking at, um, these are just all, this is Obama and Clinton and Bush. We see lots more up and down in all other presidents' approval ratings. And one thing to note about um, Trump's approval rating is that it is flat. It goes up and down a bit, but is it much more flat? That is a reflection partially of polarization and of um, this negative partisanship, that once you decided um, whether or not you liked Donald Trump or not, that feeds into your approval rating, and there's not much information that's being um, updated in your evaluation of Trump. So the other thing to note is, um, so I'm showing you two, this is from the Monmouth University poll. Monmouth University has the kind of the longest running time series right now on approv of, approval of impeachment proceedings, okay? And they are matching this with the Gallup poll looking at approval and support for impeachment proceedings. Now, I don't love this question. The question is whether you approve of impeachment and removal at the same time. I think this conflates two things, um, but that's the question they ask. And this is looking from nine months before the House inquiry um, uh, for Trump approval and tr support for Trump impeachment, and then putting that up against historical public opinion data on Nixon. So a couple of things to note. One is that approval of Trump and support for impeachment go together and are extremely highly correlated. If you approve of Donald Trump, you do not approve of the House impeachment inquiry. You do not think he should be removed, okay? Um, however, uh, and this is very different than, um, than Richard Nixon, because over time, if you look at Nixon, the support for Nixon impeachment, it goes up and is about the same, t the same percentage of people, about 45% of people at the time of the House impeachment inquiry for Nixon thought he should be impeached and removed. That's the same as Trump. What is different is that as people were more supportive of in um, impeachment inquiry, they, their, his approval rating dips. So those things are negatively correlated. Okay, so what does this tell us? This tells us that people now, because of polarization, because of negative partisanship, might not be taking in as much information. And the media system is also part of this, right? People can now pick up information about, uh, that they agree with, or they may discount information, they may not be paying attention at all. So, but now we have these hearings on TV, or you can stream them, and, and how that might that matter? So, the hearings might matter, right? They could give people information to update both their approval rating and their attitudes about impeachment because we know they go together in the Trump era. They pro but they do here provide us competing um, visions about the meaning of events from Republicans and Democrats, okay? Republicans on the House impeachment inquiry are doing their best to say, what happened um, in the call with Ukraine either was unimportant or this is business as usual versus Democrats who are giving a very different vision, okay? We also know that the media coverage is going to affect whether or not people support impeachment, also whether or not they think it's important in deciding their vote. Um, and one of the things, again, I think is worth noting is that the support for impeachment and removal in the same Monmouth poll, if you just break it down by people's self-identified partisanship, is very different by which party you identify with. While overall, 44% of people are supportive, and that has grown a bit over time, um, only 9% of Republicans versus 77% of Democrats. So there's a are supportive and 41% of, of independents. The growth and the pressure on members of Congress to vote one way or another is going to come from their members more than all the other people in their districts. And so wh whether this m moves, independents move, and whether Republicans move um, is going to determine how many um, members in swing districts are going to vote. Now last, I think it's really important to be very cognizant of what this media coverage of the hearings. Most people are not gonna watch the hearings, but they may look at media coverage to decide, again, what's the meaning of this? How should I think about it? Should I support impeachment? And then should I call my member and tell them how to vote? And I think um, the media, they're kind of, an e I don't know if I have any Newhouse students, they're kind of easy to criticize um, in this kind of, um, 
coverage because what they are covering, so this is a tweet from yesterday from NBC News that says, the first two witnesses called Wednesday testified to President Trump's scheme but lacked the pizzazz necessary to capture public attention. So apparently you can come and talk about bribery or quid pro quo, but if you don't have sparklers in your hair or if you don't set things on fire, this is not enough to capture attention. When we get this kind of media coverage that is focused on the horse race, it's focus on criticism of the TV coverage, I think they're doing a disservice to the public. Because most people, again, are not going to be watching the hearings directly. They're going to go to the mass media and say, what should I take from this? And if the mass media is just saying, well, you should take that these witnesses are boring, or these ones have, there was some coverage of the voice of the, the, mem of the testimony come on guys, do better, right? This is democracy that in action, we should really be um, doing better in our coverage. And the last thing to note is in 2020, um, the members of, uh, again, who is gonna make the decision? The House probably has the, I don't think Nancy Pelosi puts impeachment on the docket unless she has the votes to um, get a, a vote for impeachment. Removal is going to be a totally different ball game in the Senate. Um, and so I think we should pay attention to, again, senators who are up in 2020 and what the approval rating of Trump looks like right now and what it looks like going forward, because this is going to play into their strategy of how, whether or not they should vote for removal or not. So this is just from um, uh, Mistress of Faction looking at these gray um, states here are um, states where uh, Trump's approval rating is either um, negative five or plus five, around 50%. So these are places where there might be some leverage and we might see some movement potentially of senators if they're up in 2020 to uh, make a difference in their reelection campaigns um, to vote with the president or not. Okay, so that's all I have. I'm gonna let you go. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna follow up Peggy's lead, not have slides as well, talking without a net. Uh, but it, I think the, the reference that uh, Professor Keck made at the very start of the discussion today, I think is really apropos. This is a political question. It was a legal matter, <clears throat> this could be decided as exactly as he described, and, and for all the reasons they chose not to at the time the framers put together this particular framework, uh, that this not be decided based on a Vox Populi position of the public overall about whether or not the guilt or innocence on a particular matter should be the dispositive feature of this. Instead, this is more a question of the uh, depth of support and, and, and uh, confidence that the public has in the leadership at the time, the president at the time. And again, as much as we've described, described throughout the course of the discussion here, this is not a peculiar process that is unique to the president, but it gains an awful lot of attention when it is. No question. Uh, it is in the language of jurists, the judiciary, a political question. And that is precisely for the purpose of describing this as something that can be resolved, or should be in the mind of jurists, resolved on the part of the public at large. As you can, you can subscribe to two different points of view of how you define what is the nature of a political question. My favorite is uh, that of uh, National Lampoon, which defines it as, you know, uh, the, the politics meaning uh, derived from the Greek word meaning many, and ticks, which are blood-sucking leeches, okay? <laughs> or you can look at it more from the context of exactly what the nature of the political and politics and its definition is about, which is about us, about the citizenry, and about our view how we define standards as well as conduct that we will consider tolerable or admire to the point where we admire for the purpose of voting for that particular leadership position. So it is not when the jurists use the term political question, 
that they use often to render matters of legal issue back to the Congress or the legislature, depending on, on the jurisdiction, uh, for the purpose of determining that citizen opinion rather than the politics of the day, it is to render it back based on the dynamism of what we see within the democratic experiment we've been into now for nine, 250 years for the purpose of deciding these issues on the basis of the disposition of the citizenry about that, that question, not based on its legal precedent or any other matter. And exactly as I think uh, each of my colleagues here have described, uh, the history on this question of defining it from a legal standpoint is, at best, still unresolved of what constitutes a high crime misdemeanor, uh, bribery, the, the, the treason features, every other dimension of what was incorporated as guidance by the Constitution was intended to be an interpretive point at the time in which it occurs by the citizenry, by the public, and our tolerance for that view. So it is not the political question, a pejorative term in this context. It is judicial speak for relegating the issue to the Congress as the appropriate body to clarify public intent and interest of the citizenry in exactly defining that behavior. In effect, the framers left the grounds of impeachment and conviction to the Congress and the Senate to interpret the will of the people in defining what constitutes an offense that is so egregious that removal from office is warranted. And the framers set that bar exceedingly high. As you've heard now twice, the proposition you've got to get 67 votes of 100 in the United States Senate is one hell of a high bar. And it's not something, it, it does transcend in every one of these circumstances, the majority at the time of the occurrence of the imp articles of impeachment being referred to the Senate by the Congress, in that, by the House of Representatives. In that context, I think it, it really bears uh, you know, reiteration of a couple of points that have been raised here. Uh, in, in the case of modern, in modern history, of Nixon's impeachment or the prospect that it would have occurred, I think it's, I agree with Professor Thompson, it's all but likely, and more importantly, all but likely he would have been convicted. But based on, pro on the fundamental proposition that his own party would not have hung with him, and this is a really significant distinction. I think this is where the political question comes in most distinctively. Because, as Professor Keck described, there is nonetheless at its origins, Hamilton's view in Federal 65 was in fact that this was likely to be a condition in which the party of the president would in turn defend the individual based, not based on whether or not it's a legal issue or not, but on the basis of the politics of the time. And the public disposition is going to be the matter that needed to be preserved best for definition truly of whether this applies in the case of the President of the United States. Um, so as, as a consequence of that, the Nixon question was, was, was moot by virtue of the fact that he resigned. And the reason he resigned is because he knew he didn't have the votes. That was at a time that the, the Republican minority in the House and the Senate was still sufficient in numbers to have denied a 67-vote majority, supermajority in the United States Senate. But there was confidence that there was no way that there would be any, any Democratic defectors, nor would there be any or the depth of Republican support would be insufficient in order to thwart that particular objection. Uh, that was a political question. It was a determination on the part in August of 1974 of Richard Nixon that he simply was not going to survive that particular treatment. So we were denied the opportunity really to determine exactly from a you know, precedent standpoint. What is it, what kind of behavior is it that we would expect from the leadership the national leadership, the President of the United States, that we would consider to be 
so egregious as to remove, not because of its legal determination, but because we found it as citizens to be unacceptable. And so that political question is what ultimately turns on the definition of what is a high crime, misdemeanor, et cetera, going down the line of what was framed in the Constitution. And the definitions of perjury, for example, as described earlier in this panel discussion, uh, were determined to be not applicable in the case of the, of the Clinton uh, um, um, Senate trial that was conducted thereafter and not found to be, he was acquitted to the charge of the articles of impeachment as it pertained to the question of perjury and a tie vote of whether he obstructed of just, justice or not. But notably, in, at that time, the, the majorities of the, of the, uh, on both the House and Senate side as a political matter was a Republican majority. With a Democratic president was determined to have acquitted him by 10 of the members of the majority joining all of the members of the minority, the Democratic Party at that time. And so as a consequence, that was a political determination, not based on whether or not there was a determination of the application of, the, of, of lying to a federal grand jury or not, this was more determination that did that rise to the level that we as citizens viewed as such so egregious as to remove from office. And in this particular case, the bipartisan vote, not exercising its, its, its capacity to vote in, in a way that the majority, as Hamilton feared, would overwhelm the position and deny the public opinion in this case. So in this circumstance, I think where we're, where we're headed at this stage is in all, I think it's, it's a near certainty. I, I, I would go further than, you know, than what you have in this particular respect. I think the House is going to overwhelmingly vote to impeach the President of the United States. And it will be largely across, along party lines. There will be some Republican defectors, but not many. And certainly, none or not more than what we saw in, uh, uh, in 1999 with Democratic defectors on the question of, the clear question of perjury and its application to the President of the United States. Uh, so this is not going to be a big surprise to see as it was demonstrated in 1999 and demonstrated yet, it's going to be demonstrated yet again uh, in uh, 2019 that there is no prospect that the articles of impeachment will fail in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, however, my bet is we're going to see at least four members of the United States Senate minority, us majority, excuse me, the Republican uh, majority at the time, voting in favor. And it may be more but it will be insufficient to reach the supermajority that is determined uh, you know, by, uh, for all the reasons that I think Professor Guderian has described in terms of the public opinion and the move, mood in which it's been going to be expressed and therefore motivating members of the Senate to, uh, to, to temper their opinion on this. While it may not be enacted in that regard and, him, and he, he convicted for that purpose, it nonetheless, much like the Clinton case, doesn't really turn on the legal question at all. It's much like that case, there is little doubt that the actions on the part of the president that it will be the nature of the articles of impeachment coming forward uh, are accurate in terms of his actions and in actu actually conducting himself in a manner that would rise to levels that, that jurists as well as um, anyone else in the legal community would determine were a matter of guilt if any of us were to do this. This is an entirely different question because it's not on that standard. It is based on the legal, on the political question. And so the final point, in my mind, is going to be that the effect of this, Hamilton's intent, as, as very aptly described by Professor Garrick, was in order to avoid a, a popular overrun in one direction or another for any reason, 
that would not be reasoned in terms of the larger public interest and acted upon by the Congress of the United States. And so therefore, it was designed on purpose to be a very high bar indeed. Not because of its legal determination, but because of its political application. But in the course of doing so, what we've seen in modern history is this in so many ways is a definition of what we as citizens will tolerate. What we believe should be the standards of con con conduct on the part of our national leader. And in doing so, it has been degraded both in the case that we saw in 1999 and yet again will be in this year. We're tolerating a lot more. The debate has become coarser. Our question has become much more about your affiliation and your partisanship and a lot less about what we believe are principles of conduct that we think are worthy of enforcement. And in that regard, we all ought to reflect on that. And that, hopefully, is what will motivate more than four members of the majority to think seriously in when, when, the matters, when the articles of impeachment are brought before the Senate to vote on the conviction in this particular behavior. Thank you, Sean, and thanks to all four of you for those insightful and, and varied perspectives on this issue. Uh, I really just have one substantive question that I want to put to the group, one general question of reaction first. But before I do either of those two things, while we're on the topic of impeachable offenses, uh, I committed one uh, in my introduction, uh, which was to neglect to thank uh, one of the main sponsors of this particular lecture, the Norman M. and Marsha Lee Berkman Fund. So, Norman, if you're watching on the live stream, I beg forgiveness. I throw myself on the mercy of the Senate. <laughs> okay, so let me just ask this first question. Uh, of a general kind, and uh, very briefly here for responses. Is there anything that any of the four of you have heard from your other three colleagues that you really want to jump in on and quickly comment on in, of, of any kind? Let's start with that, and then I have just one question for you before we open it up to the general. I don't have question. any comments. I just want to know who you think the four are, uh, <laughs> Republicans in the Senate, right? I can think of one. <laughs> Uh, I think Lisa Murkowski, uh -huh. um, uh, Susan Collins, um, okay. I think that's more than likely, and um, Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney, okay. to be sure, and the fourth. Cory Gardner might be. Uh, yeah. I think it's either that. I don't think it, so. And potentially okay. it could right. be Rich. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you you've got. Um, you know, I think I think it's four is 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 the betting line in my mind. Okay. Anything else? Any of the four? Of you? I just want to say one thing. I was a congressional fellow shortly after um, the Nixon case. I worked for a Republican, so I'm a Democrat, but I got to know a lot of Republicans at the time, and I talked with members of both parties um, about the Nixon case, and I also. Um, heard some talks from, from members of Congress on both sides um, who talked about their experience during the, the Nixon case. Mm -hmm. I think we need to realize that most members of Congress, certainly in 1974, I think it may be less true in the Clinton case and less true now. But in 1974, members of both parties took their responsibility, their constitutional responsibility and their representational responsibility really, really seriously as they determined what they would have done had they needed to vote. And in the case of the Judiciary Committee members of both parties, as they actually had to decide how to vote. It was a really impressive uh, display of um, political responsibility, meaning political in the same sense that Sean O'Keefe used the term. And 
I think what I miss now more than anything is that sense of deep and profound responsibility among members, um, regardless of party affiliation, toward the process. Um, it has become so partisan. I find that very troubling. Um, I, I want to make it clear that, that even Democrats who had very strong reasons for opposing Richard Nixon on policy grounds and on political grounds yep. still found it extremely painful in 1974, members in, on the House Judiciary Committee, for example, to vote in favor of recommending articles of impeachment to the, to the House as a whole. And that members of Congress who were Republicans who were on the committee who supported President Nixon on policy grounds nonetheless believed in some cases that they needed to vote to recommend articles of impeachment to the body as a whole. I don't know if we see that as much today. And that as a citizen and as somebody who really loves the Congress very deeply, um, that troubles me. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that. So, so let me ask a question. Tom hasn't. Had oh, I'm sorry, no, Tom. I'm, no, Go I'm good. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So, 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 let me ask a question about not about predicting likely outcomes or who the senators might be who might vote in favor, but rather about about us in this room. Okay. And just thinking back on over what all four of you have said in different ways, this question of where the line is, mm -hmm. how do we know when it's crossed? the fact that ultimately this is a political question and which politics and the public are going to be the key, that we are deprived of, as Sean, I think as you said, the opportunity for precedent here to sort this out. Um, how do, how, I'd like to hear from the group, how do we figure this out now for ourselves? It's inevitably political. We ought to be more statesperson-like in our way, Peggy, of thinking about it. So we're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we know whether we've reached this threshold of removal from office? Do any of you want to help us think about that very basic question? You've, you've brought us up to the brink. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. now, now get us there. Go ahead. I mean, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. How, how do we do that? Um, so, uh, right, so from two different angles, right, if you're sort of following like public media and political commentary on the current process, right, from one angle, it looks like a textbook case of abuse of power and a textbook case in which what is called upon is for our elected representatives to exercise their authority as statesmen and stateswomen uh, um, uh, uh, in, the, in our Madisonian system of checks and balances, right, to stand up for the republic and for fundamental constitutional principles, right? It's one, one of the one of the remarkable things about going back and reading the founding era yeah. stuff is like the examples they gave of like Hamilton's writing says, well, like what should we do if we elect a president who starts using the powers of the office to enrich himself and his family? What should we do if we elect a president who sells out American interests to a foreign power? What should we do if we elect a president who starts abusing the powers of the office to um, uh, interfere with the sanctity of our own elections and therefore preserve his own holding power? They, they, recognize all of those classic examples of abuse power. So from one angle, that's clearly what's happening. From, from another angle, right, what you're hearing on some media outlets and what you're hearing from Republicans in the committee, if you've been watching testimony, is that we have a partisan witch hunt, right, in which Democrats are obsessed with removing a duly elected Republican president, um, and they will go to any lengths to make up false conspiracies about his abuses, uh, his alleged abuses of power, right? So those are like diametrically, it, it's like, it's like our, our two decades of polarization like crystallized into like one clear moment here, diametrically opposed and irreconcilable views on what's happening. And, and, and so all I can say, right, is everybody who's a citizen, right, right, like 
read, read the stuff and think about it, right? Make your own judgment, right? Don't go by what somebody on TV is telling you to think. Read the White House call summary of Trump's conversation in July with President Zelensky. Read it out, get together with a friend and read it out loud. One of you be Trump and one of you be Zelensky. And read the April and, one and, too. And read it out loud and tell somebody, tag, if you got a third friend with you, tell them to like raise their hand if they hear anything that sounds bad, right? Because it is really bad. And that is the edited call summary released by the White House. It's There's that. ellipses in it. They left some stuff out. That is their own call summary. And it's really bad. So that's my view, right? But read the documents yourselves, right? We have firsthand documentary evidence and firsthand testimony, right? Re read or watch, right? Ambassador Taylor, right? Grad I'm, I'm not giving a brief response. I'm not good at that. Right? <laughs> and, Ambassador Taylor, right? Graduated fourth in his class. Gra graduated fourth in his class at West Point in 1969. Volunteered for infantry duty. Led a rifle company in Vietnam. Decorated combat veteran. Served career diplomatic service under presidents of both parties. Right. Trump's own Secretary of State called him back into service after they fired our other ambassador to Ukraine, right? He shows up and he's like, what the heck is Rudy Giuliani doing? What kind of way is this to run foreign policy? It's like complete bananas, right? And he just lays it all out as clear as can be, right? So like, don't do what some, don't think what somebody tells you to think. Read, read the first-hand accounts, read the documents, and then call up your members of Congress and tell them what you think of them. That's what I would say. Else? It's hard. It's hard to go after that. But, <laughs> right. Um, so I, I think in thinking about what is over the line, you want to think about what is the role of any elected official, right? And the role yeah. of an elected official is there to serve the national interest and the public. And elected mm -hmm. officials are there to do the public's work and um, to reflect what it is the public wants. And the elected officials are not there to line their own pockets. And they are not there to use their office in order to get favors to win the next election. Right? And so I think you want to think about, get, when you read the transcripts, right. um, think about if that were, um, it, if it sounds like Goodfellas, um, <laughs> there's a reason that it sounds like good fellows, right? Because um, I'm not saying, but I'm saying is a request to do something, right? Asking for a favor of someone when you have the power in the relationship tells you about what is going on. Um, so I, you know, I'm with Professor Keck. We always give you more homework. Um, yeah. Go and actually read and think about um, what it is we, you would expect um, from someone who is trying to do the national interests and someone who is trying to enrich themselves and, and interpret what is going on in the transcript. It's not a transcript. It's a call <laughs> summary. And, and in, the, um, what's in the hearings through those lenses. We also have an edited summary now that was released today of an earlier phone call, which is, if anything, more bizarre than the, I mean, seriously, it refers to the Miss Universe pageant. I do not know why. But that Ukraine always had attractive women in the Miss Universe pageant. I do not know why that's relevant, but it was part of what the White House released today. Um, I want to point out one more thing. As a historian, we have even less to say about predictions than um, Professor Guderian said political scientists do. But I want to point out that in 1974, when the House Judiciary Committee voted as it did on the five articles of impeachment, uh, three of which they um, recommended to the House and, and two of which they did not, um, this was before the so-called smoking gun tape was released by um, the Supreme Court decision of August 1st. And so um, all I'm trying to say is that judgment is really important. After the August 1st release of the smoking gun tape, it was very difficult to believe that Richard Nixon had not committed an impeachable offense. But the majority of the House Judiciary Committee, including a substantial numbers of members of the Republican Party, made that determination before that moment. And this is why I think it's really, really important that um, we view impeachment as a process and not a single event. We don't know, for example, now what the charges would be, what the specific articles of impeachment would be for Donald Trump. 
We're talking about the fact that certainly he will be impeached and you know that it's almost certain that he will be. But we don't even know what the articles are yet. Um, whether there will be one article or whether there will be several. Um, so I just think we need to be very, very careful as we proceed further. I do think that there are indications, strong indications of impeachable offenses so far in the documentation we have. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disagree with my colleagues on that, but we don't know what the articles of impeachment will be that will eventually come before um, the Congress and the American public. So, you know. Uh, final thoughts on that? Yeah, then I'll open it up. exactly. I'm recalling there was a, uh, a remarkable chairman of a committee who was on the opposite side of the hill from where I worked in the Congress at the time, uh, who had a resounding observation whenever debates like this would break out about what the right position is and where everybody lines up on one side or another. And his response in a southern drawl that only he could affect with great uh, skill was, why ever be surprised when people act exactly as you expect them to? Yeah. All right? Yeah. So what, what exactly, exactly the terminology that Professor Keck recited to us from Federal 65 was a, a concern over the partisanship that will naturally be inherent within the political parties and within the public overall. And so prompting the better angels of our nature, if you will, um, there was a, a, a fascinating editorial here, either today or yesterday, I forget which day it was actually published, and I was mentioning to Professor Gary as we were, sat down to talk about this, it just struck me that the currency of the moment by John Meacham, who wrote, mm -hmm. you know, The Soul of the Nation and so forth recently, Pulitzer Prize winner and so forth, a very insightful commentary about how ironic it is that on 68th Street in New York City is the Council on Foreign Relations and not more than 15 blocks away is Trump power, you know, and it's the difference between the wise men and the wise guys, okay? Mm -hmm which matches very much along the theme of many of the comments mm -hmm. just made. And there's no question that this, it, it is hard to argue the point. I, I take mm -hmm. Professor Thompson's admonition that we not get a lot of exercise by leaping to conclusions over what the articles will say, but I think it's pretty clear yeah. they're not gonna be good. Mm -hmm. And it's, o it's overwhelmingly probable that the Democratic majority will vote to impeach. I think those two points oh, are yeah. almost I, unassailable. I don't agree. I don't disagree, for the record. So, oh, yeah, so, as a as a consequence of that, it is manifest exactly what was forecast by Hamilton. Yeah. In this circumstance, we're all act. We're, we should not be surprised when we act exactly as we expect them to. The yeah. bigger question is the one Professor Rea raised at the beginning: How do we rise above this? Yeah. How do we find a different standard to this? Because we, we can, it's almost predictable in terms of how this will go. And yet, is that what we really think of ourselves? Is that what we really think is how we want others around the world to see this? Yeah. The impeachable offenses, if you get down to the political question of that, is the lack of standing that we have across the globe now for the things we have always stood for and now no longer seem to. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that ought to be the point to reach into, define the answer to his question. What is it that we think will be an intolerable level of behavior on the part of any president, yeah. having set the standard that lying is okay? You and I can be convicted and sentenced for that. President of the United States, president says, no problem. We'll deal with that. We don't want the disruption. That's what was determined. And by each of these precedents, we are degrading yeah. what we stand for, what the principles are that made this whole experiment possible in the first place. And by degrees, we are minimizing that. That's something that ought to be part of the public referendum next time around.
Mm-hmm. Let's either all rise up and say, yeah, we're willing to tolerate this for as long as it takes, regardless of your party affiliation or who you are. Or we say, no, let, let's, we got to rethink what it is we believe are the standards we want to be manifest that defines who we are. Amen. Excellent. Thank you. So we've got two microphones going around, and I'll try to call on two people at a time. We've got a woman in the back there. I see that hand up, and then that gentleman right next to us. Bring the two microphones to them. And please be brief. Hand the microphone back when you're done. (laughs) (laughs) So thank you very much. And um, I'm a grad grad student in Maxwell. And um, I have a comment at at the end. It's a question. So I'm not uh, American, uh, but I'm familiar with the America, American interior uh, politics. Um, and uh, President Trump, uh, Trump uh, foreign policy is uh, affected me more than interior pol- his po- policy. So um, I understand how you are scared of his presidency for 2020. And uh, actually, me too. <laughs> but um, I understand the, your like mostly American feelings. Um, I mean, this class of American, I mean. But um, with all the talks you had, you had uh, now, uh, let's say, if even Congress agreed with uh, uh, his impeachment, uh, you have Senate. And we, you know better than me, Senate is maybe is not gonna impe- agree with his uh, impeachment. Right. So I want to, what is your suggestion? What do you think? You suggested that, uh, for example, call at the end, what's your action? Call to the member of Congress. Uh-huh. Okay, but uh, how about Senate? What's your suggestion? Yeah. What, what do you wanna do? Same. Thank yeah, you. Same, same. I mean, call, yeah. call them yeah. too. Um, so, um, so weigh, so weigh, weigh in with your elected representatives in both institutions. But also, I would say, and again, whichever side of the issue you're on, I would say, um, uh, think about ways to act collectively as well as just individually. Right? Groups yeah. of people are more effective in politics than individuals. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of collective actions going on on both sides of the debate. And so, find some like-minded folks and and, and get together with them too. And keep in mind that the the vote in the Senate, assuming that the president is impeached on one or more um, articles and it goes to the Senate, even if he is, is cleared, and I think right now it looks like he might be if it goes to the Senate, um, there's another vote coming up in November of 2020. And um, even if he is kept in office, there is another opportunity for the American public to weigh in um, in the general election. And that includes not only voting for a a Democrat or a Republican for president, but also for members of the House and Senate. Um, So I, I think it is likely that he will be impeached but not convicted, but then there is the election in the fall of 2020. Thank you for an enlightful presentation. Um, my name is Marco. I'm a Fulbright Humphrey Fellow here at Syracuse University, Maxwell. And I'm from Brazil. And the impeachment process here called me the attention because we have the president impeached in 2016. And especially with your presentation, I got a lot of similarities that we have in our process uh, in Brazil, the polarization environment, and also the partisan uh, process. And I totally agree that uh, impeachment have to be considered a process. Uh, our impeachment very quickly happened after the president lost uh, her temporary majority on the Congress. And Brazil is a multi-partisan uh, country, it's a little bit different than what happened. And I want to ask you, what are the constraints that representatives here in the US have from the party? I mean, in Brazil, the parties, the party leaders have too much power to enforce the representative affiliated their parties to uh, vote in favor or against something. I want to, to, to understand more this difference from here. Mm. Thank you. Um, 
So we, we generally have a kind of weak party system. So individuals run on a party label, but they're not, um, they're not, they're nominated by, in primaries rather than put on a list, right? So party leaders right. have incentives and they can take away resources for good or bad behavior, some, meaning they can take away committee assignments, they can send staff, they can um, help with re-election funding, but mostly we have a pretty weak party system, which means it's um, all partisans for themselves. Um, so one of the things you'll see is party leaders will give, again, incentives for, for good behavior. So our Anthony Brinzisi, yeah. who's yeah. A, a member of Congress um, from the 22nd District in New York, who did not vote for Speaker Pelosi, Mm -hmm. um, did not get his first choice of um, committees. committees, but recently got his first, got a committee that he was looking for, and I imagine it was because of some of the um, positions and votes he's taken on um, the impeachment inquiry. He mm -hmm. saw the light. Right, right, <laughs> right, but, but yeah. so th that tells you, right, so... There was, he had Speaker some Lord. right had some ability to okay. make decisions, um, and there were some incentives for doing so, but no real sanctions other than not right. They didn't kick him out of the party, but he didn't get his first choice of committee. So, <laughs> so I think uh, you'll see party party is a really important cue for people about how they're going to vote, um, but there's not real cudgels um, for most members of the party. And I just add one thing to that, and that is that he's in a district that is considered a very close district between the parties, and the Democrats want to keep that party, they want to keep control of that seat in the Congress, and so there's only so far they're going to go to punish him because they want him to be reelected, um, even if they find it frustrating. Okay. And, and, and just, it's, it's looking like it's going to be a rematch. Yeah, just yes. a, just a yes. one, one really quick addendum is that, right, so for the, it, so like while historically party leaders in Congress have not had a whole lot of power yeah. to be able to compel um, uh, uh, their, their caucus to stay in line, um, for the Republic, on the Republican side, that's tempered a little bit at the moment by Trump's consistently high popularity among the Republican base right. and his Twitter following. So they're not afraid of Mitch McConnell so much, but they're afraid of Trump, who can, any, Republican member of Congress who goes against Trump, he will encourage a primary challenge against them. Mm. Yeah. Right. He's not and shy about calling yeah, them out. Yeah. Let me, let's get some more questions. Two more. There's this gentleman up here. And Do you want to take right a couple, here. Grant? Yeah. yeah. Just, Field just to trip, yeah. Gather a couple, yeah. All right, so uh, my question, well, first of all, my name is Brendan. I'm happy to be here uh, representing the College Republicans today. Uh, okay. It's a good group, and I'm glad that we get to be a part of this. Um, but my question is for anyone on the panel that feels that they can answer this uh, properly, but uh, there was a lot of discussion about predictability of uh, what's going to happen in the Senate and um, also the, uh, the political aspect of impeachment. And my question to you was, although Mr. O'Keefe, you said potentially four people could break from the Republican side um, in the Senate, how many do you think could break on the Democrat side? Because I know that's, there are three specifically uh, Senator Manchin, um, Tester, oh. as well as Doug Jones. But uh, going further than that, do you, if you don't anticipate any of those guys to break, do you anticipate maybe senators from states like New Mexico or Minnesota or no. Arizona no. Uh, or even New Hampshire, states that the no. Trump campaign has publicly outlined as states that they think they can flip in 2020? Do you see any, I mean, Adding to that, the impeachment process is going to go on for a couple more months, so you know you never know how public approval will flip in that time. So, do you anticipate at all any of those states uh, becoming players? So, any Democratic defectors, or particularly from these states? And you said you wanted to take two questions, right? Well, we'll get we'll, okay. let's do this one quickly, and then we'll okay. get to them. Yeah. I, I think th this issue cuts to the previous question as well. Yeah. Um, I think the, the the Senate Minority Leader. If any Democrat were to break ranks, and all the ones you just talked about are certainly likely prospects, will positively have to pay for that. Yeah. And he'll make sure of it, and he's shown his strength to do so. No question about it. I mean, Except he is, Manchin. Uh, Manchin, he, even he has he gotten the message very he clearly that we're going to make your life miserable unless... All right. I mean, this is not new. They, both sides know how to do this. 
And in this particular case, there's going to be, again, for all the reasons Hamilton feared, okay, in terms of the, the party enforcement is going to occur. And the senator from New York, who is the minority leader, will make absolutely certain he uses every single tool within his kit bag to make sure the caucus stays with it. That's going to be the, uni you know, the, the unifying force in this. The two members of the House have already been basically treated as, you know, <laughs> pariah off to the side who did vote with the Democratic majority on the, the passage of procedures of what the articles of impeachment would be. So, I mean, this is not a shocker to see this kind of stuff happen. There's no question. And in the end, a lot turns on this in terms of the ability of not only the caucus to support it, but also all the apparatus within the party to help generate re-election opportunities. Brendan, let me just add one thing about Senator Manchin. First of all, he was just re-elected, so he's got five more years before he has to face the voters again. And secondly, he's probably the only Repub Democrat at this point who can carry uh, West Virginia. So I don't think they're going to offend him. But I think he's going to vote for impeachment if, uh, for conviction if it comes to that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, and and in the same thing with Minnesota. They were just both reelected. So go ahead. I'm a PhD student in Maxwell Social Science. I have a a short question, what happens, how does the scenario change, how does the prognosis change if there's not just one Ukraine, if there's three mm -hmm. or five or 10? Mm, that's a really great question. I, have no I mean, so, so partially answer, Lisa, so politically one of the challenges for Speaker Pelosi, right, has been to, right, she was slow to come around to support uh, impeachment, right, she was cautious and deliberate and wanted to not do it until, what she kept saying all year was until the public was on board. Um, and the Ukraine call evidence was so clear, I think from Pelosi's ex uh, uh, perspective, so compelling and easy to explain to the public, and there was immediately some evidence in public opinion polls that, that, that views were shifting, that she thought now was the time. But then, you know, it seemed like initially her plan, and maybe it's still her plan, was very much to try to keep it a, a narrow, contained impeachment process focused on Trump's bribery right. of the Ukrainian president to, uh, 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 to interfere in our own election. Um, and, but as with Andrew Johnson, right, Trump has committed so many potentially impeachable offenses and commits new ones every day, right? So today he was tampering with a witness, right? During yeah. Ambassador Yovanovitch's testimony, he was tweeting out um, uh, uh, um, uh, angry criticisms of her during the testimony and Schiff interrupted the testimony and read Trump's tweets and said, some of us here on this committee take witness tampering very seriously, right? So that, that is a potential new impeachable offense committed this afternoon. Right. And right. so it's, it's, it's a really big strategic challenge, right? Like how quick and contained do you try to keep this or how expansive do you try to, right? I mean, we haven't talked about the emoluments clause violations right. at all, right? There's lots of other stuff. And that's, that's why I was saying- That's the, potentially on the table. The charges have not been specified yet, right? And there could be new ones. And I noticed that some of the college Republicans uh, rightly were going, oh, well, that wasn't really witness tampering. But again, witness tampering in this context is not a legal definition, but what people think it is. So I just want to, you yeah, know. Well, okay, but that, that's a central theme I've been trying to really drive home, all right? Exactly. I mean, this, is, this is the challenge. I, I think if, if this was a courtroom situation and a jurist were that's a different presiding, thing. I, 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 I think Professor Keck is right on the mark. Absolutely, yeah. no question. This is witness tampering. It's a political question. Yeah. And the guy doing the tweeting has figured that one out. Yeah. How yeah. to make this as big a popular debate. Right. Because it doesn't really matter. It's not a jury of your peers. It's not a situation of convicting on the basis of violation of principles of law. That's right. He's testing all of that. That's the part that we ought to sit back and say, God, well, is this really where we want to go with this? So I, I and do, make that declarative statement. I'm sorry. No, no. I do think this is important, though, yeah. right, about whether or not there's multiple new things is mm -hmm. that 
people will get tired at some point. I always say like my colorist over the last two years has made a lot more money because I'm going gray at a much higher rate than I expected in these right. last two years. <laughs> right, right. Um, because the Mine pace of work. events, <laughs> Fire mine. the pace of events is so quick in this administration and the number of things that we might be considering is larger than usual. And I do think it's worth thinking that um, I, containing the impeachment inquiry is very strategically smart because yeah. the public only has so much attention and they will mm -hmm. also get tired of this. Yeah. Um, and you need to capture their attention when, and, um, and wrap this thing up fairly quickly. I agree. I so agree. just I think maybe one more question and then we can continue this conversation outside. Uh, saw a hand go up down here in the front. Yeah, go ahead. The last question here. You. Yes, yes, you, Somebody. yes. You. Be brief, <laughs> be brief. I will be brief. Okay. So this is something I heard on NPR the other day and it's a concern I share. Um, with the Nixon uh, impeachment hearing, you guys mentioned that there was sort of this kind of bipartisan, very honorable uh, a feeling of commitment to constitutional principles that lacks today. I think we're all aware of that. If, what about the president this sets? Even if you impeach without a conviction, and that has some kind of ramification for the election, mm. which is favorable to, I don't care. Well, what's gonna stop uh, a different administration being stymied by similar efforts? Because ultimately <laughs> impeachment is a political question and I don't really trust today's Congress or tomorrow's Congress to not do this again for less honorable reasons. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the fact that we've only talked about three potential, yeah. three impeachments will tell you this is not something that Congress does Every lightly. Day. Yeah. And that the implications, even if it weren't directly on the um, election, are still pretty dire. That the idea that you, uh, there's all this other um, work that could be being done right now on foreign policy or domestic policy isn't getting done because the Congress is spending time um, reigning in the president and or use, and um, I would say like Congress strikes back, right? So yeah. we are, Congress is article one in the constitution for a reason and it is reasserting its authority in a separation of power system. And I think that is really important to keep in mind to go forward that there, there has to be a balance and Congress is reasserting its power in this way. Right, I would agree completely with what you just said. I think you've, re you've raised a very, very intriguing point, though, which is Gee, one that I think, um, it, again, cuts to the, to, you know, the, the saw I'm on you know, of the political question. Articles of impeachment in and of itself uh, are a statement in it. Just, uh, it it's, it's serious. Regardless of whether it's governed by the majorities and overrun in that direction, the fact that they happen at all, for exactly the reasons that Professor Garrett said, the Congress, the fact that it's happened as rarely as it has, really does take these things seriously. It may not appear that way, but it really does. Mm -hmm. and, and the deliberative process that Professor Keck referred to, that the speaker really took mm -hmm. to deal with this, was a calculated view of, is this something that will drive home you know, our ability to actually succeed, or is this something we really have sufficient information, as Professor Gugarian said, to differentiate in the minds of the public that this is really egregious behavior? What's the message we're trying to send with this? Again, it's not a legal issue. It's, it's all a matter of you know, debate in the, in the popular view. And so the, the, the alternative mm -hmm. of passing articles of impeachment and then the Senate independent of the question of, of a conviction, deciding to pass resolutions of censure mm -hmm. or determination of what principles we believe are appropriate or not that are not something subject to removal from office and so forth, is a very powerful statement that then, as exactly as Professor Thomas was talking about, provides the opportunity to the people mm -hmm. next November to exercise our will in that regard, mm -hmm. rather than what really lends itself to this whipsawed argument that we're seeing today of, is this witch hunter? No, it's not, you know, tastes great, less filling. You know, I mean, 
the public is turning it off unless you're really invested in one argument versus the other. And there yeah. are plenty of people who are. We know plenty of them, don't we? Okay, there are lots of folks we've encountered who have a very firm view on one side or the other. Yeah. But in, in, in the larger sense, this is about us defining what the standards are. And that's, that's a tougher one. And that's going to take a little more debate moving forward. Because there is no doubt, you know, on the face of this, this is just an incredibly, unbelievably unacceptable form of behavior to see from a leader of the United States. That said, do we have a process that really is going to put us in a position of all the things that will result if we follow this through to its extent? And that's the reason, the wisdom of what they did Yo, know, those many years ago, and that Hamilton spoke to, made it a really hard thing to do. Yeah. Is it is serious. Okay, so let me say two things before we close. First, I just want to remind everybody and invite everybody to the reception outside, which again is made possible by the Norman M. and Marsha <laughs> Lee Bergman <laughs> Fund. <laughs> and... Second, uh, join me in giving another round of applause to the four great panelists here for that. Thank you.